The exciting thing I found writing this book was how many wonderful people there are already doing wonderful things, and many of whom have never heard of each other because they've been called by some particular aspect of something and just plowing ahead, full steam ahead, got to do it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pelicanus. Pelicanus is a nonprofit organization focused on sharing the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. Now, this is Conservation Conversations, our long form documentary style show that highlights the people and organizations that are making it their purpose to grow the conservation field and to show that people have and still are making monumental differences in our world with intentional change. Head over to pelicanus.org to find all of our episodes and more. On this episode, we have Tony Hiss a world-renowned author of many works, including his latest book, Rescuing the Planet. Tony has a long history of caring for the environment and writing about it for The New Yorker, as well as many, many books. It is a delight to be able to talk with him, so please enjoy our conversation with Tony. So, Tony Hiss, thank you so much for joining us. We're very, very excited to have you on here. Uh, if you don't mind, please tell us, tell us who you are and uh, talk about your book a little bit. Well, it's such a thrill to be with both of you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my book is called Rescuing the Planet. Um, it's about what we used to call the biodiversity crisis, but we now know is just one part of the uh, planetary crisis. Um, I'm a writer have been pretty much most of my life. Uh, for a long time, I was staff writer on the New Yorker magazine. Uh, then I was a visiting scholar at New York University. This is my 15th book. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, I guess the first book I wrote was a children's book about giant pandas. Uh, and written a number of books on a number of subjects. And then this book was a book that just seemed to me uh, needed to be written and I was waiting for someone else to do it and they, they didn't, so I did. Uh, uh, because the more we learn about uh, our relationship with the other creatures around us, the more we realize how urgently necessary it is for them to thrive as well as us and how as the scientists have told us there are now something like a million species of plants and animals in danger of extinction and the latest scientific report from IPCC which I'm sure you guys looked at came out in March saying the decisions made this decade will affect us for thousands of years. We sort of got used to thinking that uh, the great law of peace of the Iroquois Indians that dates back to, what, 1450 or something like that, and some people say is a precursor of the U.S. Constitution, is brought up the idea of thinking seven generations ahead. Well, if we're thinking 3,000 years ahead, we're thinking 120 or more generations ahead. Uh, and that's what I love about the the concepts in your in your book is you, you, it, it. I feel like in conservation we we have to start thinking bigger, longer term, but for whatever reason, the way our society works is you can't think too big because then people don't really quite get it. So I love that you went there. I love that we're talking big, big things because it's really hard to get people to 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 think that way. But again, some, like you said, someone had to write it. <laughs> and I saw that it took you 10 years to write. And it's again, these are big concepts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess what started me off was just the plight of the animals. Uh, a few years ago, we lost the last uh, male uh, white rhinoceros. Sudan supposedly had the temperament of a golden retriever. Uh, even though he was the second biggest land animal next to elephants. And then there was the loss of uh, Lonesome George, the last Pinta Island Galapagos tortoise, 
who might have been a hundred or more years old. Uh, Solitario Jorge, as they called him down there, Lonesome George. Um, and, um, and we've had to coin this awful new word, endling, meaning the very last of its species. Well, it's time to put an end to endlings because life depends on life. Uh, it's the pattern of created by living organisms that allows us to have food to eat, allows us to have the next breath to draw. Uh, this isn't just uh, liking, you don't have to love animals to, to like this idea, uh, but it helps because uh, they are pretty lovable. I just wanted to touch on that because you bring up inlings and bring up inlings and the end of inlings in your book, but you also bring up this really fascinating concept of spark birds. And I was hoping that you could explain uh, spark birds a little bit and how the idea of spark birds is actually larger than just birds. Well, among birders, there's this idea. Something, some species of bird at some point in their life called out to them and wouldn't let go. Uh, and thereafter they were hooked, whether it was a cardinal flashing red or some rare warbler that they never would think to see or something. I, I mean, in New York City, now there's this eagle owl that escaped from the zoo just a month ago and has people flocking to Central Park looking for them. Uh, so something grabs you, but it doesn't have to be a bird. It could be a, a vista or it could be a, a sunset. It could be anything about the natural world that has, calls out to you and, and thereafter you're a changed person because you have this connection. And one connection leads to many other connections. So there are thousands of roads into this, into this, both, well, both to the, this, this glorious uh, appreciation of things, but also this incredible urgency that we have so little time in which to make a difference, and yet just enough time if we keep doing what we're doing. And there are wonderful, the exciting thing I found writing this book was how many wonderful people there are already doing wonderful things, and many of whom have never heard of each other and just plowing ahead, full steam ahead, got to do it. For instance, there was this um, commodities trader in uh, the panhandle of Florida named M.C. Davis, who thought of himself as a good old panhandle boy, had actually made his first stake playing poker, never gave much thought to the environment, except he was caught in a traffic jam on I-4 in Florida one day and, and was fuming and so fed up he thought anything is preferable, and he saw a sign on a local high school, a Black Bear Seminar. He thought, whatever, and he peeled off, went inside. He said there were about six people inside, a couple of lost Canadians, a couple of tourists looking for some donuts, and a politician hoping to get somewhere. And up on the stage were two ladies, two women, talking about the plight of the Florida black bear, the, subspecies of black bear down in Florida and how they were suffering because their habitat, uh, longleaf pine forests, were suffering. And he, he was hooked. This was his spark bird. And the next day he s sent them a check that would cover two years of their expenses. And they were immediately suspicious. They thought, who is this person? <laughs> from nowhere, and he said, well, I do want something from you. I want a list of the 100 most important environmental books because I'm way behind. I've got a cat caught up. So they wrote him a list. He read the books and then decided he, it was up to him to help try to re rescue the longleaf pine forests of the southeast, which had been the signature ecosystem down there, which had been felled after the Civil War. Uh, that was the reason Scarlett O'Hara never went hungry again. 
the plantation was a bust, but they started chopping down this beautiful, incredible forest, which was both a rainforest and a fire forest, because it depends on fires, natural, naturally set lightning-based fires sweeping through that area periodically, uh, which is why it's a forest that looks like a park, because the trees don't branch out until quite high up to avoid the, um, the low-level ground fires. And the down below is just sort of a layer of almost uh, grasses, so you feel like you're wandering through a beautiful park. Anyway, he bought up 51,000 acres of played out peanut farms and said he was going to start a new forest and spent half a million dollars a year on planting longleaf pines. Um, when I got down there 13 years later, still looked pretty scruffy to me, but he said, well, come back in 287 years. It's going to take a while. Uh, and MC's no longer with us, but he left the money to keep going for the next 300 years. And people just feel something and need to, and the need to do something. And, and MC for me was the poster boy of that. Uh, although I met dozens and dozens of other people as I was traipsing around the continent. Uh, because we think uh, in terms of east to west as a settlement pattern of the continent. We've bought into the idea that the frontier disappeared a hundred years ago, the famous Frederick Jackson Turner thesis. But if instead of just going straight west, he had made a right turn and gone north, he would have seen something uh, extraordinary and it was still there in his day, is still there in our day. Uh, it really knocks your socks off. And it's also one of the reasons why we can hope to to save enough habitat, to save enough animals and plants, because the Canadian government, although it was terrible to its indigenous inhabitants, as we were, never kicked them off the land. They're still there. And now the Canadians are turning to them and saying, we want you to set up an entire second parallel national park system, which you will run and administer. You will be the, the mucklucks and moccasins on the ground uh, and the park administrators. And, and that's going to make it possible for Canada to achieve the goal of saving, protecting enough land within this decade. Because suddenly now everyone has got this phrase 30 by 30 in their heads. Um, because on the one hand, the Biden administration's uh, America the Beautiful program adopted this as a national goal. And, and on the other hand, 196 countries last December meeting in Montreal adopted this as a global goal. The concept being that by saving 30% of the land and water, that will say, leave enough habitat um, for enough animals and plants to survive so that we can survive. Now that's actually a slightly watered down version of the 50 by 50 concept of the half earth concept, the one that I encountered meeting up with uh, E.O. Wilson. The, the half earth math established by dozens of field biologists is that most creatures need up to half of their original habitat as something still living uh, and still something that will support them in order for the species to thrive and survive. At the moment, um, we've protected about 15% of the planet. And it took us 150 years to get there, by the way. Uh, if, you, if you count Yellowstone as year zero, 1872, 1873. Um, and now we're being told, okay, let's do 30% by the year 2030. Well, COVID slowed things down. So by the time 196 countries adopted this goal, it was already late 2022, it's now 2023. So it's the 
history is short as a decade. We've got seven years to accomplish what it took 150 years to accomplish. But the urgency is there in a way that it never was before because so much of this habitat is being gobbled up. Uh, and that's just as deleterious to life as the poisoning we do that's producing the climate change. I think something you said early on and then continued to kind of share stories was your realization or discovering of all the people across the US, Canada, around the world that are doing this because they they think it's the right thing to do, because they want to do it. They're dedicate, literally dedicating their lives to rescuing the planet. And we went through the same realization a few years, a few years back where, you know, I'm coming up in my career as a wildlife biologist and I'm meeting all these different people and then realizing, wait, I'm, I know 30, 50, 100 people just in my city that are, this is what they do. And it's like, well, if you think of it and you extrapolate that out to every city, to every country, it's like, this is a huge movement that no one's really talking about. And I believe Paul Hawken even called it the movement with no name. And it's, for us, that's why we wanted to do this, is to share those stories and tell people like, yes, things are bad, but there are so many people and so many resources and so many organizations that are making it their mission to bring things back. And I love that you wrote this book about the same same concept. And I want to hear it, every story <laughs> about everyone you met, um, but not too much because we want people to read the book as well. <laughs> OK, enough, but not too much. Um, <laughs> I, I, another thing I discovered to my amazement was that this is not a new idea. Um, there was actually the a man who was in his day the world, the country's leading landscape architect back in World War I times. His business dried up during the war, so he suddenly had a staff uh, assembled with no projects coming in. So he decided, let's do a national plan for the future of the United States. Uh, an amazing document which has yet to be published, but is available online. Uh, and he came up with the idea of protecting at least 30% of, of the country. Um, back in 1917, that was primarily for traditional national park kind of recreational purposes, but, but it would, would have given us that kind of legacy. We could have, instead of had 30 by 30, 2030, we could have had 30 by 1930. Great conservation biologist, Ed Wilson also, the great ant biologist. I got to meet when I was writing this book, and he was a, I was very lucky, he was a charmer, uh, and um, was trying to get people to think in larger scale terms, in a practical way, as you said, Austin, it's hard to think too big. So I think originally he was thinking by throwing out a, a huge figure, it was what, uh, some business visionaries call a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. You set your sights high, uh, as we did, for instance, during the moon launch days. There's actually a science to it. You have to, the goal has to be big enough so that people will think it's worthwhile heading for, but it has to be not too big so they think it's beyond their means. So certainly that's what President Kennedy was throwing out, saying we'll put a man on the moon in this decade. And, and it was a challenge that could be met. So in talking to Ed, I actually coined the phrase half earth, which he then, then went and ran with. He wrote the book called Half Earth so that I had to find a new name for my book. Uh, but the more you talk about it, the more it began to seem like something real and necessary and not just uh, a way of galvanizing things. So there's so many different ways of approaching this, all of which are exciting and many of which people can personally get involved in. You don't have to just join an organization. And, and you can, whatever it is that's calling out to you, 
chances are you're not the only person hearing that cry. <laughs> and you can find people in your own neighborhood who are already doing things. You can do things with them. Your book is incredible for a lot of different reasons. One, it tells the orthodox conservation story very well. Um, it has, it, you tell the history, you tell the story uh, of all the big players, all the folks that are involved, um, and where, you know, the origins of it, the origins of the Appalachian Trail, et cetera, et cetera. But you also do a great job of exploring the boundaries, and, and I like how you call it the life at the half earth interface <laughs> um, and the boundaries of what we perceive as conservation. And you have some great examples, including uh, the Icarus, uh, global monitoring with animals, um, where they're uh, using remote sensing to find storks um, uh, that find locust eggs to anticipate the next locust plague. Um, you do a great example or a great job of um, showing uh, neon um, and crossover conservation and some really like kind of cutting edge conservation ideas. But one of the ones that really caught me was this paradigm, this philosophy a little bit, um, where you brought in the history of the American with Disabilities Act. And looking at it through universal divine, uh, sorry, universal design, um, I was wondering if you could explain your ideas behind that a little bit more. Um, people who work in the built and the natural world and how this universal design is kind of playing in with this half-earth idea. Well, universal design was a brilliant achievement um, a generation ago by uh, an architect who at the age of nine had caught polio and was then paralyzed for the rest of his life, um, had to be carried by his classmates to classes in college because there, there was no way else to reach the classroom, decided that it was time to get beyond. It wasn't that he had disabilities, it was that the buildings had disabilities. Uh, they weren't accommodating his needs. So he came up with the idea uh, of universal design, which is a building that could be used and appreciated uh, by people, whatever their physical needs were. Well, of course, th th that did lead to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, one of the things we're learning and that challenges us is the abilities of these other species that are our co-inhabitants. We know now, for instance, that elephants are peaceful, caring, empathetic creatures. We know that octopuses can recognize human faces and use tools. We know just as of last summer, by a brilliant paper by a German zoologist, Lars Chitka, that bees who have brains the size of a poppy seed have rich inner lives. So we're beginning to face up to the fact that we are surrounded not just by many, many other creatures, but by a whole sea of sentience, of awareness. There are two implications of that, to that. One is that every acre matters and that there is no such thing as vacant land or an empty lot. It may not have human uses on it, but it is full of life. So the next step beyond universal design, which meant universal for humans, is all species design. If we're going to add our uses, let's do it in a way that also accommodates the, the uh, critters that are already there. Uh, we don't have to subtract something from the landscape in order to add our own purposes. We have to be able to do that in a clever way. The other thing that constrains us that, that I found sobering and as well as thrilling was we think of ourselves as living on the land or inhabiting the planet and surrounded by nature. But in fact, what we inhabit 
is this oddly shaped thing, the biosphere. Uh, and it isn't a sphere at all. It's, it's just a layer on top of a sphere. Um, and it's ancient. It's almost as old as the planet. And it's incredibly abundant in terms of the species it has housed, housed and has created and brought into being. But it has this third dimension or almost this lack of a third dimension that's very, very thin from top to bottom. It has this innate vulnerability that we never think about. Most species, not all species, but most species live within a range, a 12 and a half mile range that goes from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Mariana Trench in the Pacific, the deepest part of the ocean. As someone has pointed out, laid out flat, that's a distance you could drive across easily in 20 minutes. So we live within this, we, we and all life lives within this vulnerability. And we don't really feel it on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's as much of a constraint on what we do as anything else. I love that. And it, I, I, one of the quotes I took down from your book in regards to the biosphere is, what happens when the envelope is the letter? <laughs> what happens when that thin envelope is actually has all the content, has all the richness? Um, and that was just such a wonderful way to transform that idea for me. It's, um, and of course, we don't even live on the bottom layer of this uh, band of life, which as far as we know is unique anywhere in the universe. There is life not just around us, but there's life below us and life above us. Life within the land, and of course, life within the ocean, way down below us, up, perched up on the land, as well as life over our heads. So it's another getting used to we have to do of thinking. Now, we know that astronauts, lucky astronauts, looking back at the Earth, say they've been transformed, looking at the Earth as a whole, uh, seeing it as the blue pearl in space and that their lives are forever changed. Most of us won't have that opportunity, but instead of... Um, this overview effect that they talk about. We have to somehow cultivate an inner view effect from within it uh, and have that same sense of just how uh, amazing it is to be part of something that exists nowhere else and sustains us. You talked about, you know, your career writing for The New Yorker. You have 15 books. You mentioned your first book was the children's book about pandas. What was it that made you interested in conservation work or wildlife or any you of know, that? I've been thinking about that question since you guys wrote me. Um, maybe it's partly just that I'm old enough so that uh, when I was a little kid, uh, nature seemed more of a more natural, if, if I can express it. Just there were so many fewer people. There was so much, so many, so much obvious distance from one town to the next. This was way, way before the interstates got built. Um, of course, I was privileged to come from you know a family that could go up to a tiny village in northeast Vermont in the summertime. But life felt like a clearing in the woods rather than something that had usurped the woods. Um, so it, it just felt natural to me. And I think my mother was always very alert to the coming of spring. First, there would be the pussy willows then there would be the forsythia, then there would be the crocuses, then there would be the magnolia blossoms, then there would be the tulips, then there would be the cherry and apple trees. This progression was something 
you could look for even in Greenwich Village in the window boxes and little front yards of people uh, and in Washington Square Park, a block away from this apartment that I'm still in that they moved to in 1947. Uh, I mean, we're lucky because looking out the front of this apartment, you see modern buildings across the street, but looking out the back, you see this shared backyard uh, with a grove of ornamental crab apple trees. And we're on the third floor in a, a walk-up apartment. So we're sort of at canopy height. Uh, so we get migrant birds coming through, we, as well as the blue jays that live in Washington Square Park. We get, uh, you wake up at five in the morning to bird song in the middle of Manhattan. So it, it just seemed like that's the setting. So you, you've been been able to go from that where you started and maybe that sparked some interest to watching things potentially decline in certain areas. And you've written this book, Rescuing the, Rescuing the Planet, about people that are rescuing the planet. And at some point there has to be a, a level of optimism or hope that has to kind of carry you through it. So, and it, I know that there's a quote in your book is that uh, you write, optimism is oxygen. Please t talk about, the, you know, especially your, your quote, the optimism is oxygen. Uh, it, it, I know it has to, something has to carry you through. Well, that was, I think, attributed to Benton Mackay, the father of the Appalachian Trail. His whole idea was, he was inspired the year he graduated from college, which was 1900, when he and a friend, uh, they whacked their way up Stratton Mountain and the Green Mountains of Vermont. No trails in those days. And shinning up the tall trees they could find and swaying there, he had this idea for the first time, what he called a planetary feeling, that he was in a single place that stretched along the ridges of the Appalachians all the way from Maine down to Georgia. And that's what inspired him 20 years later to proposed the Appalachian Trail, but the trail was itself just the centerpiece of what he thought of as the Appalachian realm, this landscape along the east that would be the savior of, of people who lived in what he called the beehive cities, because they could come there and reestablish their connections, uh, get real oxygen as well as the oxygen of optimism. Uh, and in fact, he was right. The trail was built within 12 years of his proposing the idea, this wild, wacky idea, almost entirely on weekends uh, and on vacation time by volunteers. It is probably the largest piece of public works in human history built by volunteers, uh, willing volunteers. So uh, that's extraordinary in itself, the response he got and that continues to this day. For a long time, the people who built the trail concentrated very carefully on completing the trail and protecting the narrow band of land around the trail. Now they've gone back to Mackay's original idea of, of the realm itself, protecting the larger landscape. And it, it seems that so many people get inspired at different stages of their life, at different sort of scales of their life. It could be something very much within what you can actually see as an individual or hear as an individual, or it could be feeling like part of something larger. But they're all points within this biosphere, this community of living creatures. You know, one of the questions we get a lot um, when we do talks or just talk to people is, what can I do? How do I get involved? Like, where, where, what do you suggest I do to, to, to get involved? And so we try to then delegate that question to everyone we talk to and say, hey, you know, what do you think? Like, how do you, what suggestions would you give to somebody to say, like, hey, you know, yes, there's these problems and all these people are doing great work, but what do I do to get involved? It's really not hard to get involved. 
uh, whatever it is that's that's speaking to you, um, there's probably already a group in your area working on it. Um, and if there isn't, you could start one. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of organizations to align yourself with if you're interested, who do wonderful work, uh, land trusts, uh, for instance, these pollinator pathways we were talking about, just growing a few native plants along the edges of your lawn as a way of keeping the bees in business and the butterflies. Almost anything you do is positive. And, and another part is just sort of, I think, reaching out to the fact that this, this is where we are. We're getting this different sense of where we are as well as what's called, what we're called on to do, as well as a different sense of what the life around us is. As I said, it's turning out to be so much more uh, aware of itself and, and so much having so many uh, capacities. And one of the reasons why I love your book is, actually I'm just thinking of, I think it was uh, the architect Christopher Alexander's quote, I think it was his, he said, are we the kind of people that will allow ourselves to be changed by something new? Or are we trying to seek to change that new thing? And I think that's what your book does, is it allows us to reflect and how can we change ourselves for the better because of this wonderful work. So thank you. Oh, thank you guys for what you do. Uh, so happy to have met up with you. Look forward to staying in touch and hearing more about what Pelicanus is doing. Tony, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and we really want to highlight the book uh, please you. go go to your local bookstore, download the audio book, download ebook, however you need to consume it. Please uh, hear about these in uh, inspiring stories. Uh, and, and, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. And we, we really do appreciate it. And, you know, we're honored to have you on here. Oh, my pleasure. Um, great good fortune to have met up with you. We wanted to say thank you again to Tony for taking the time to share his story and stories from his book. So please go find Rescuing the Planet now and get inspired. Hosts and producers are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producer is Megan Joyce. Music was provided by A Picture Book Studios. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you want to help. Thanks again. We'll talk to you next time.